Well, welcome back to Bibliology. We're on lesson 10 today, uh, but I need to tell you that I'm teaching something different than what you would see in the student's manual for this week. I felt like there was just a little bit more that we needed to give to extend a couple of the topics we've already taught. And so uh, we will be out of sync. Don't let that bother you. Um, we'll get back to some of those other items uh, at the end. But I wanted to really do a full job of, of, of teaching this particular subject. So today, I want to talk about major issues in biblical interpretation. You see, uh, we can go through all of the things that we've gone through, uh, but it's possible uh, to miss some things. And so I want to talk about big picture items today. We'll, we'll not be in the scripture a lot, but these are important items for how we approach our understanding of the scripture. I wrote an introduction, and today I want to read it to you. I don't usually do that, but I wanted to get every word just right, and so I spent a little extra time doing this. So let me read this to you, and then we'll get on with it. So far, we have established the major elements of bibliology, including the basic rules for hermeneutics, or biblical interpretation. The Bible <coughs> is God's special revelation. It is inspired, that is, God-breathed. It is inerrant, and it is infallible. The canon of Scripture has been recognized as God's complete word. All of these things can be true to us, and we could still miss the point in some of our Bible studies. Now that's important. Let me read that again. All of these things can be true to us, and we could still miss the point of some of the scriptures. There are three more understandings that we need in order to be able to rightfully divide the word of truth. And I want you to come through with these three today because they'll help you, they'll help guide you, and I think you will see, even though we aren't quoting a lot of scripture, that they are very much biblical. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> First of all, Let's talk about the importance of inductive Bible study. Inductive Bible study. Now, you might be wondering, well, what does that term mean, or what does that mean to him as it comes to Bible study? So let me just give you a little bit further analysis of this. There are two kinds of reasoning <clears throat> on which we can approach a subject or an investigation. One is inductive reasoning, and the other is deductive reasoning. Inductive and deductive. And the difference is in the beginning, of course, the suffix that's there, in or de. Inductive reasoning is reasoning in which we start with a blank slate. Now, that's an old-timey education uh, term, blank slate. Back in the old days of the one-room schoolhouse, every child had their black slate they had to bring with them to school, and that was the one that they used to write their math problems on and let the teacher see if they got it right or do other writing on it. And at the beginning of the class, of course, the teacher would say to the students, now you need to wipe your slates clean. We can't have anything on the slate, because if they were going to write a math problem, she didn't want the student to have extra notes or another example below it to help him out. She wanted to see if he really got it. So we had to start with a blank slate. And the teacher would know then that when she saw that, that's what that student wrote. Inductive reasoning is like that. It starts with a blank slate. When we come to the scripture, uh, we don't come with any preconceived understandings or ideas. We're coming to it. Uh, as a blank slate. We're letting it speak of itself. Deductive reasoning, which by the way is not invalid in some cases, it can be used for different things. Deductive reasoning is reasoning that starts with a hypothesis. You see that commonly in the scientific method. It starts with a hypothesis and then we go to the scripture with that idea and say, well, can I prove that from scripture? Now, they're both very different approaches. But it's very important that we have inductive Bible study in mind. 
Why, you might ask, why should we use the inductive uh, method in our Bible study and not the deductive? Well, let me give you some reasons. First of all, when we come to the scripture, we want to come without any preconceived ideas. Coming with preconceived ideas can lead us to all kinds of error. What we want is just to let God speak. And so we have to come with that open mind, with that blank slate. No preconceived ideas. We simply want to observe and analyze and understand what's going on in that passage. We aren't coming with something that we think it says and then asking ourselves, is it true? Because then you can kind of twist your logic around to kind of make it fit sometimes. But you want to come and say, what does it say? Remember the old rule that I quoted a couple of times. Uh, it, what it says, okay, means. Says equals means. I almost couldn't remember it myself. <laughs> says equals means. What it says is what it means. Not what I say that I think it means. And let's just see about it. So we're observing, we're analyzing, and we're understanding. That's our full role in uh, inductive Bible study. Using deductive reasoning puts man, or puts me, in the driver's seat. It puts me above God, because I'm actually determining what that truth is supposed to be, and then finding a way to prove it. And by the way, you can find all kinds of ways to prove things in the Bible, if you're willing to take them out of context, uh, or change the meaning of them, or just redirect it a little bit. You can come to all kinds of conclusions. And so there's really no completely intellectually honest way of approaching the scripture except inductively. There's a couple of scriptures that will kind of illustrate this for us. Isaiah 48 and 17, if you'd like to turn there now. Isaiah 48 and 17. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. Now the Lord is speaking here through Isaiah the prophet, and he's identifying himself, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, I am the Lord your God who teaches you. Now the only way I know of that God taught Israel in the Old Testament was through the writings that he gave, the, the law that he gave to Moses, and through the writings he was giving to the prophets, he would teach them to profit and lead them in the way they should go. So it's the word that is God's word that is to be used, not our idea of what it might say, but just what he says. And then Jeremiah 30 and verse 2. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. There's that appellation again. Write in a book all the words that I've spoken to you. He's talking to Jeremiah the prophet. And he's saying, write it down, because people need to read what I have said. Write it down. And so, why should we use the inductive method in our Bible study? Because it puts God in the right position. He is the one that's speaking, and we're not trying to put on it some other meaning that we think it should say. It's coming from God directly. Now, there are several plans that you can use. If you go to the internet, you'll find a gazillion plans for inductive Bible study. Uh, there are two of them that I thought I would mention to you. One is the common one that's used by many, many people, and then one was my own. The first one is a three-step Bible study, and that is, first of all, observe. You take this particular selective scripture that you have, and you look at it from all sides. Who wrote it? To whom did they write it? Where did they write it? When did they write it? What was the background of that person that wrote it? Try to get as many observations as you can pull out of the scripture as possible. And then interpret it. Bring out the meaning and understand what it is saying. And then the third step is, what are the applications? Is it telling me something that I should do? Is it saying something that my family should do, that my country should go? Or is it just telling me simply something that I should know about God and all of those things? 
Now, that's a good method, and I would suggest that you try it if you don't have another inductive method to use. I had the opportunity once, years ago, in a Christian school that I was teaching at, to invent something that I thought would be helpful to students. And by the way, I had no idea that God was going to bless this and use it. It was quite amazing as it grew. I came into Bible class. It was a theology class that I was teaching there. And I said to the students, take out a piece of paper. And I suggest that you put it sideways. You can put it up and down if you want. But make three columns on that paper. Put three columns on it. And then on the top, put the topic that we're going to have. And we're going to study all seven major doctrines. Uh, and the first one we'll study is, is uh, the, the, the doctrine of God. And so put that up on the top of your paper. And then what we're going to do, you're going to have two tools that you're allowed to use in this class. The Bible and then a concordance. What is a concordance? It's a volume that has every word in the Bible and everywhere that it's found in the Scripture. So if you come across the word love, it will have a, a page or two of all the mentions of love and where you can find them in the Scripture. Nowadays, of course, uh, we find those things in our internet tools, and in a moment I'll give you the name of a very good free internet that has concordance with it that can be of great help to you in your Bible study. But we are to take a topic, and we'll say this is about God in that first unit, and we're going to look in the Bible, in that concordance, under God. And you're going to find all of the verses, and usually the concordance has a few words of the verse, so it gives you a hint of whether it would be helpful or not. But you look up that verse about God. Let's just say you turned and you found a passage that says, Be ye holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Okay. So in the left-hand column, you're going to write it out word for word. Be ye holy, for I am holy. In the middle column, you're going to make your own <clears throat> living Bible. You're going to paraphrase it. And so you're going to take that verse, Be holy for I am holy, and write it in your own words. It might be something like, I should be holy because God's holy. And then in the right-hand column, you're going to put in two or three words or a sentence at the most just what the meaning of that was in reference to God. And, of course, the meaning there would be, God is holy. God is holy. And you're going to do that for every word that you can find in the concordance about God that has some meaning to you. As a matter of fact, you may find several verses that say the same thing. That's fine, too. Just write them all down. Uh, and then, when you get done, you'll have a paper of, say, five pages long. That was my requirement, at least five pages long in which you listed everything you could find in the Bible about God, and you wrote all of those verses out, you paraphrased all of those verses, and you gave the meaning of each of them over in the right-hand column. Now, it was amazing, because once the students got into this and found that they could actually find out these things about what the Bible said, they weren't just listening to some adult saying, well, this is what the Bible says. They got very, very excited, and I think that God the Spirit really worked in that class because before I was done, I had students turning in pages 32 pages long, papers that were just immense in their scope, not because I required it, but because those students got so galvanized by the Word of God and understanding what it said about each of the doctrines in our theology course. And it was wonderful. That is also an inductive Bible plan. Why is it? Because they're going and seeing what it says first and then deciding uh, what it means at the other end. Inductive Bible study. The second thing that we need to approach today, and it's something I've talked about several times because it really is important, and that is context. You know, the importance of context, the the, the, the main rule of interpretation, as the old saying says, is context, context, and context. And uh, we've talked about this a good deal, but I have some more to say, 
and I hope it'll be helpful to you today. First, I want to ask the question, whose context are we talking about? Well, you say, well, the context of the Bible, of course. Well, yes, but let me just share something with you that you will recognize, I think, almost immediately. Isn't it possible that in my background, who I am, where I live, whether I'm rich or poor, whether I'm black, white, brown or yellow, whether I have single parents, all of those things are my context. And when I come to the scripture, it's very likely that I would have difficulty extracting myself from all of the context in which I live as I look at the scripture. And yet that is what we need to do. We're not reading the scripture as a living doctrine, a living document that changes for every individual in his background. Uh, that might be something you could get out of an application, but there's only one interpretation that's real. That's the real meaning of that scripture. And the context have to be the context of the, the original uh, autographs of the original writer. The purpose of the original writer has to be within that context. And so we're literally going back in the scripture and saying, what would that have meant to those people of his time? What would that have meant? What was the purpose of it at that time? And as I mentioned a week or so ago, sometimes the customs and cultures play in there because their culture was different than ours. And as we look at what the scripture says, we may find an answer in understanding the culture that would not have appeared in today's culture. So the context of the time in which it was written, of the person who wrote it, uh, all of those things are important. Now, there are two kinds of context. First of all, there's the internal context. The internal context is the context of the scripture itself and the surroundings in the scripture itself. We start with the immediate context, the paragraph that the verse is in. You should never, ever take a single verse and write a lesson about just that verse alone. At the very least, you need to look at the paragraph. Now, the paragraphs are generally chosen by the verses, although when the verses uh, were attached uh, as a means of finding our way around the scripture, these were not inspired, of course. And there are probable mistakes that are made. With better uh, scholarship, uh, we might find that this is a whole sentence and they've spanned two verses. And so it's important to look at it as a paragraph. And what is the paragraph saying? That's the immediate context. Second, of course, is the general context. And that would be the surrounding verses or the chapter in which it's in. Now, it also, of course, could include the book. We're looking at something beyond the verse. I guess you get the idea here. The general context, uh, surrounding verses or chapters that are involved, and then the, the, the larger context or the greater context. I don't know if I gave the same names of these terms when I did it before, uh, but this has to do with the book. That was in. What's the theme of the book? What's the main idea of the book? And does this have to do with the context of that scripture? So you have the immediate context, uh, the general context, the larger context, and then the broad context, which means all of scripture. Now one of the things that I have not mentioned, which is very helpful and very important in scripture, is being able to go across to different cross-references. They're not as popular and common today as they used to be, but a Bible with cross-references in a small center column is a most helpful thing. I know we always used to be able to buy the Schofield Bible, and many of the new study Bibles have this as well. I heartily recommend that you get some kind of a study Bible that has cross-references, because then you can follow the chain of the editor, and when he sees that this is about 
the love of Christ, and then there's another verse in a couple of chapters about the love of Christ, and you follow on and on and on, and you just keep on going through the scripture, it helps you to get the meaning a little bit broader because we're talking about the broad context. And I would recommend that you have or find something that will allow you to see that same topic. Another tool that, that used to be very popular, and there's still some of them around, you might be able to find one on the internet, is a topical Bible. A topical Bible is just a listing of all of the verses that the editors could come up with on a given topic. And uh, it could be a pretty fairly large uh, book, but it's very helpful to go in and see uh, that layout. All right, so if you go to a concordance, of course, you're going to have that word, and it can give you pretty much the same idea, only from a one-word standpoint. Comparing with all of Scripture, the Bible is a whole. God chose the books of the canon to be a whole. You need to understand that what we're reading fits in with the rest of Scripture. Pardon me. <coughs> That's the internal context. Now let's talk about the external context. And there are several of these. There's, first of all, there's the historical context. Who else was alive at that time? What other countries were there around? Especially when you get into the uh, history of Israel in the Old Testament, it's very interesting to read secular history of the same period of time. Some of the prophets, for instance, were prophesying during the time when Greece was rising to its zenith. And there were wars between Greece and the Assyrians, right there where Israel was. And so historical context can be very helpful. Uh, what other historical figures, major historical figures, were alive at that time? Uh, geographic context, I don't believe I've mentioned this one. Where was all of this going on? Uh, very helpful to have a geographic context. When Jesus teaches the Sermon on the Mount, he's standing on a meadow on the side of a hill. And when he starts to talk about the flowers, uh, he is pointing to something that the, the whole crowd could see as they came to get ready to listen to him speak. Geographically, is it a city? Is it in the country? All of these things uh, really have something to say. And then, of course, there's the cultural context. Uh, Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah uh, is a very interesting book that I recommended to at least one of our class members. And it has all kinds of allusions there during the study of the life of Christ to the customs, uh, the times as it were, uh, during that time. And there were a number of things that could be very, very helpful. Things like, well, what was a Jewish wedding custom? John 14 really plays on that whole thing. Unless you know what the wedding customs were, you don't get the whole message of that. The Feast of Cana. There were customs that were uh, surrounding that that would help us to understand uh, better what was going on there. So many, many different things that we can find in the Gospels that uh, have to do with the cultural context. And then finally, a relational context. Uh, I mentioned two or three times in the midst of the historical and so on, other people around at the time. But I'm interested in the relationships that are there at certain times in the scripture that have uh, importance. And I'd like to just take one uh, because it's, it's, it's unusual, it's unique among uh, the apostles. We know that Paul was an apostle. However, he wasn't at the beginning, was he? He wasn't even saved while the other apostles had been chosen in Jesus' ministry. And you know, the fact that Paul was made an apostle when he got saved, as he went on the road there with his animals and the people, and he had a glorious salvation, and he was called to be an apostle, and yet the other people around him weren't so sure. And that became a major, major stumbling block for his ministry. Here are some of the statements that Paul made. 1 Corinthians 9.1 1. 
Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my workmanship in the Lord? You see, Paul has to defend his apostleship because there are people coming to his churches and saying, he's not really an apostle. We have 12 apostles. Matthias was chosen to take Judas's place. Why are you talking about Paul as an apostle? But he was. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. He says, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Now there's another relational context issue of Paul's relationship with the people that he was ministering to. For a time, he was persecuting them. Now he's trying to reach them. And again, sometimes the people weren't so sure. And they thought, well, should we really listen to him? Isn't he the guy that was around chasing Christians and trying to get them uh, into prison? He had to deal with that his whole life. So when we read the works of Paul, we're reading something from a relational construct in which he is kind of the outsider among the 12 apostles, in which he has a unique calling of God that's different than any of the others and in which his relationship to the people to whom he's minister, is ministering uh, was a changing one, a radically changing one. And that's part of the whole story of the meaning of the scriptures that Paul wrote through the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit. So we have context. We have the internal context. Be sure that you look up all of those things, immediate, general, larger, and broad. There are the external contexts, historical, geographical, cultural, relational. Important for us to think in terms of context. So when you go to study the Bible, I want to challenge you not to ever just read a verse alone or two verses alone. But look around it. Look what's before it. Look what's after it. Look what's in the book. And try to get your understanding of that by observing all of the context that you can get a hold of. Now the final thing that I want to talk about today is systematic theology. You see, in the end of this, when we're studying the Bible, we're reading the Bible, we're trying to master the Bible, we're going to come to some understandings of some things. And that's part of our understanding of the Bible, that it is one book, it's a whole, it's systematic. So let me give you first a definition of systematic theology, and I hope you'll see that this is the logical extension of all that we've been studying, uh, because our approach to all of the, the questions that we've raised so far really shapes our own systematic theology. Here's the definition. Systematic theology is the system that accounts for all major doctrines in a homogeneous whole. Systematic theologies show the big picture of God's plan for his creation. I'm going to read that again. Maybe it'll be helpful. Systematic theology is the system that accounts for all major doctrines in a homogeneous whole. Systematic theologies show the big picture of God's plan for his creation. Now, in saying that, and giving you that definition, what I really implied in there is that, that the systems of, of the understandings that we have, the doctrines that we have, first of all, can't contradict each other. That's just common sense, wouldn't you say? Uh, two, that they work together. No doctrine is all by itself. They work together. Sometimes they're complementary. I remember a very important book. It was a very important book in my life. Schaeffer was a great philosopher. And Francis Schaeffer wrote many books about biblical philosophy and theology, but his last book was written as he knew that he was going to die. It was poignant to me to pick up that book because I knew that when he wrote this book, he knew it was going to be the last thing that he ever wrote. Have you ever, ever wanted to have that privilege of being able to say just what you wanted to say before you died? Of course, we can't 
have that. We don't know when we're going to be taken up to be with the Lord. But wouldn't it be wonderful uh, to have that assurance? In his case, he wasn't sure he'd finish the book. So don't get me wrong. It wasn't that he had some special dispensation. But he did. He wrote the book just before he died. And they are the words of a man who has studied humanity, studied the word of God, loved God for much of his adult life. And they are words that are especially poignant because he speaks to the problems that are so very current and have a future hold on us. And in that book, The Great Evangelical Disaster, by the way, get the book. <laughs> it's available and not for a lot. Get that book and read it. It's a wonderful book. The Great Evangelical Disaster, his main point was to point out that there are two attributes of God that are complementary, and we often miss that because we tend to highlight the one or the other. He said they are the holiness of God and the love of God. And then he goes on to make the point. He said, you know, there's a group of Christians out there that think that the holiness of God is his most important attribute. It controls all the others. And so they're all about righteousness. They're all about rules. Uh, they're all about what God wants us to do, performing as we should, because we have to be holy. We have to be perfect. This is a group of people that tend to point to other Christians, look down at their nose at them and say, well, they're not as good as we are. These are the Christian Pharisees. But he said there's another group that's inclined to believe that the love of God is the most important attribute. And so they stress the love of God. The only important thing is that you love people. It doesn't matter if they believe like you do. Uh, it doesn't matter if, if uh, there's sin in their lives. Uh, we love them all alike, and uh, yes, it's just fine. And that leads to a false tolerance. A false tolerance and inclusiveness. We'll just bring everybody in. Well, we want everybody to come to the gospel. I would never turn away anyone that would come to our church from hearing the gospel. We don't accept them as brothers and sisters as part of the fellowship if there are things in their lives that don't match up with the scripture. Now, here's the point that Schaefer was making. He said, you know, our mistake is to assume that one or another of God's attributes is primary. He said, as a matter of fact, both of those attributes ought to be applied as one, two sides of the same coin. Just like when you come to salvation, there's faith and there is repentance, all part of the same coin. And so we should love each other. We should love each other passionately. We should love the world, the lost, and all that are in them. And yet we should stand for righteousness at the same time. In fact, sometimes righteousness causes us to do things that may be hard on those that are loved ones, but that are good for them in the long run. And so, in uh, the systematic, that clock almost threw me, in the systematic theology, we understand that all major doctrines are accounted for, that they don't contradict each other, that they support one another, and that they complement one another. So that we can see, if we read and understand all of those doctrines, we can see it as a whole and see it how it fits together and how it works together to demonstrate God's plan for his creation. Now, let's be honest, there are some different systems that coexist within Bible-believing Christianity. If there weren't, we wouldn't have Baptist churches and Presbyterian churches and Lutheran churches and, and, and so on and so forth. Even believers that will say, I believe in the literal, historical, grammatical interpretation of the Scripture sometimes come to different conclusions about different passages of Scripture. And I just want to highlight three of them for you today very quickly to point them out and to just to 
raise the awareness uh, that this is part of the picture. You know, uh, these are our, our brothers and sisters. Uh, we must avoid the I'm right, you're wrong mentality when it comes to this. These are brothers and sisters. In, in a minute, I'm going to uh, name three. But I, I do want to make that point because sometimes, again, in some churches, it gets to the point where they're so sure of themselves that unless they were baptized in, in a Baptist church, they weren't Christians. You say, is that really true? Yes, that's really true. I know of churches that actually believe that. And uh, so we need to be sure that we understand that we must avoid that I'm right, you're wrong mentality. When I was in rehab for my heart attack, I had a very good friend who was in charge of of the exercise lab. He was a Mennonite fellow, wonderful Christian brother. And he used to just delight in coming with some new joke or another about our faith. He came in one day to me and he said, I've got a, I've got a story for you. And I said, oh, okay, good. He said, two Mennonite men were talking. And one of them said to the other, you know, brother, I'm quite sure that you and I are the only ones that are right about this thing. But sometimes I wonder about you. <laughs> we can become so insular that there's nobody else in the world that believes like we do. Well, there are three systematic theologies today, all within what we would say is our camp of Bible-believing Christians. And the first one I want to mention is the Reformed theology. Sometimes uh, it's also called Covenant theology, although there is a distinction and if you want to ask me about it sometime, I'd be glad to answer that. But Reformed theology is a, a theology that uh, really is based on the covenant point, point of view, the covenants of the Bible. And uh, they name two primary covenants, the covenant of man and the covenant of grace or the covenant of God. The covenant of man was a covenant of works given to Adam and Eve. And, of course, they failed it. And so then God brought a covenant of grace, or a covenant of God, to them, through which they could be forgiven uh, salvation by faith in Christ. And, of course, how would they know Christ? Well, because of the, the, the animals that, that was, would have sacrificed, even though the law wasn't there yet, God instructed them sufficiently to understand that that was a sacrifice for their sins, pointing to the time that the, uh, the, the Redeemer would come. And in fact, in, in their presence, he prophesies that to Satan. Uh, and so we have Reformed Covenant theology. Because they really just deal with the two covenants, one the covenant of man and the other one the covenant of grace, then there are several things that become true. One is that the church and Israel are the same. So any promises that were given in the Old Testament are given for all Christians of all times. And that would change our understanding and our interpretation of the meaning of Israel. Uh, it also brings them to a point where they believe in amillennialism, uh, perhaps, or uh, something like that, because all of the statements of Scripture about the coming of the Lord in the Old Testament, for instance, in the prophets, are for both the Jews and the Gentiles that were saved uh, in the later era. Uh, therefore, that coming of Christ is a one-time only thing, and uh, they don't believe in any rapture or literal thousand-year reign. Uh, and, of course, in order to do that, they have to engage in a little bit of allegorical interpretation, but they are generally still literalists. But Reformed theology would be churches like the Reform, Dutch Reformed Church, the Presbyterian Church, and Reformed Baptist churches. And there are quite a few of them, by the way, uh, which they believe as Baptists in every area, uh, but they choose to identify as Reformed Baptists because they believe in the covenant theology. The second group that, again, are literalists, but have a different point of view than we do, would be the Pentecostals. Now, I'm not talking about 
uh, the small groups uh, of Pentecostals that have jumped up in the last 50 years. I'm talking about the mainline Pentecostal denominational churches such as the Assemblies of God. And again, these are our dear brothers and sisters. Uh, they have just one particular doctrine, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, in which they interpret the scriptures differently. And so they believe that the gifts of the Spirit, including speaking in tongues, translations, and so on, all of the gifts of the Spirit uh, are for today. They were not suspended, as we believe, but they are for today and are still exercised today. So if you go to a Pentecostal church, you may have a healing service, you may have speaking in tongues, all of these things taking place. That's the second major group uh, that's out there. And again, I remind you, I'm not talking about wealth theology or some of those other offsprings. I'm just talking about the mainline uh, denominations there, uh, Church of God primarily and Assembly of God. Uh, the third one is our group, the group that we have, and that is dispensational theology. And in dispensational theology, uh, we divide history into segments, three, seven, or ten, depending on who you talk with. And each of those dispensations, uh, there is a responsibility that God gives to his children, and uh, there are consequences when they fail, and each time they fail, and then there's a new dispensation. And so you have the dispensation of law, for instance, which was for Israel, and, uh, uh, and then you, know, you have the dispensation of, uh, well, before that, you know, innocence, and then law, uh, dispensation of grace for the Christian church, and there are seven of them, or ten of them, or three of them, depending on which way you want to go with this. And uh, we're all saved by grace in whatever dispensation, but God gives us a different requirement of something we should do during that time that we live. Well, we've gone through some important stuff today. The importance of inductive Bible study, and I hope that you will follow through and our guidance on inductive Bible study, when you open your Bible, to really observe and understand. Uh, we need to understand context and get a book that has to do with uh, the life and times of Jesus or other Old Testament contexts of customs. There is a tool, it's called E-Sword. E-Sword, you may want to jot that down. If you go online, you can download it for your pad, for your phone, for your computer. It's a wonderful tool. It has a concordance in there. Uh, you can download a myriad of different translations and look at those different translations to get uh, the ideas. There are, there are also commentaries, some of the good old uh, traditional uh, conservative commentaries that are there. E-sword. Excuse me. <coughs> I want to just give you one last point, and that is, it's important when we approach the scripture that we have humility. It's so easy for me to say, well, I know what the Bible teaches, and you have to be wrong because I'm right. But you know, I think I'm right. I'll find out when I get to glory how right I am about my theology. But it's important that we approach it with humility. That although we don't worship and serve with the Pentecostals or the Reformed, we can recognize them as brothers and sisters and appreciate them for that. And in the workplace or wherever we have our concourse with them, agree about the importance of reaching the world for Christ because they believe that too. And so the Lord bless you. We'll have some new things again next week. Go ahead and read through your student's book. I may not come back to it before the end of the course. There's some good things there. Uh, but I want to continue in our, our teaching concerning bibliology. And I trust that it will bless you this week and that you'll be a blessing to those around about you. Bye-bye now.